Hi everyone and welcome to week four. We're going to be talking about database schema this week. So we're going to start with what is database schema? So when we're talking about databases, we have to figure out how our data is being organized. In a relational database, we want to organize our data in particular ways. When the data is organized, we need to make sure that we have some variety of map so that we know what everything is in general. Schemas can also include rules or formulas for how the database is done. Using these schemas will make sure that data integrity is maintained. So what I mean by that, when we have a schema, we can kind of think about it like a giant map or visualization of our database. This visualization is probably going to have some relationships, some rules, some labeled keys, stuff like that, which we're gonna to get to in a minute. And the idea is having this all laid out in a plan beforehand is going to make it so that as we are adding things in or creating the database or creating tables from scratch, we have a plan that we're following that everybody has agreed to. So having this relationship all laid out means that we can see at a glance what's going on. One of the problems with having data just sort of listed out is it can be really hard to pick out what's going on with the data. Like if you just looked at a spreadsheet that had, you know, a thousand rows and a hundred columns and a whole bunch of numbers in there, it wouldn't necessarily give you much of an idea of what you were looking at. So we end up wanting to have things like row labels or column labels, sheet labels, stuff like that. Databases are going to have the same thing. We're going to have table labels. The things that are in the table are going to want labels. And then we're going to want to have descriptions are the types of data that we have. So having these rules in place means that our data is more likely to be accurate and stay accurate. One of the things that a lot of people tend to not necessarily think about with data is how dirty data is. Now what I mean by that. When we talk about data being dirty, it's the accuracy of the data. This can be anything from data that we're collecting and people remember it wrong or they've written it down wrong or it's put in the wrong spot or the, you know, data entry was done in a slightly wrong way. Like any of those are completely possible and happen all the time. So having a map of what's supposed to be going on gives us some ideas. So like, for example, if we were looking at books, we would have, you know, titles, authors, publishers, and publication dates. So publication dates are probably going to be integers of some variety. You know, the book was published in 1970, 1990, 2020, whatever. But we know those are going to be integers. So if we see that we have a column that says publication date, and all of a sudden, instead of those, we see blue, we know that there's a problem. So one of the things that we can do is say, you know, all of the dates have to be integers. If somebody tries to add in an integer, we'll take it. We're not necessarily going to check it. But if somebody tries to add in anything that isn't an integer, such as, you know, the word blue, then we're going to say, oh, well, we think there might be a problem. And it's, you know, it turns out somebody was trying to record the book cover of color or something ridiculous. Schemas also mean that we can share this with others. So when we are creating databases or updating and modifying our databases, we want to make sure that all of the information that we have in here, we can also share with others because in general, we don't work as islands. So, you know, when we're working on a database, it's not usually just one person working on it, one person accessing it, one person updating it. Usually a whole team is doing this. Maybe it's a whole company. And so having this schema means that you can share it with the rest of the team, company, shareholders, whatever, so that everybody can see what's going on. A perfect database that you can never share isn't going to be as useful because all of that data is basically like not accessible to anybody else. So it's like not really that much of a step above we haven't collected our data. 
So what's included in a database schema? So in general, you're going to have things like tables. The tables should have labels and they should also have labeled fields. So we might end up having a table of book titles, a table of author titles, a table of publishers, stuff like that. Then we're going to have primary keys and foreign keys labeled. So we remember primary keys and foreign keys from previous weeks where all the tables will have a primary key. The foreign key is how we are illustrating the relationship between the tables. So, you know, we might have book ID, um, author ID, stuff like that. And that might go into, you know, one table that's showing the relationship of all of those other tables. So a database schema will actually include that as part of the picture. If we have any rules or requirements for adding data or if particular data types are required, we would probably have some notes for that in the database schema. The data dictionary, things like that. So we're going to make sure that we have notes on all of our rules and requirements someplace easily accessible so that anybody that's going to be looking at it will have the ability to go find it. Schemas tend to include pictures and graphical representations. So most of the time when we look at schemas, they're going to frankly kind of look like pictures. So it's not as useful to have a database schema where we say like, you know, we're going to have a book table. This book table is going to have an author's table. Instead, we would have an illustration of the book table with the example. You can see with the PDF assignment that goes with the week, I have a sample schema, so you can see what that looks like. Uh, so some advantages of having a schema. Design consistency. So if you have a record of all of the things that you've done and everybody has agreed, yes, this is how we are, in fact, organizing our database, um, that means that anybody that has to interact with this database knows what was done, the decisions that were made, and then scalability means that it's easier to make the database bigger. Scalability really just refers to how easy it is to take something small and make it bigger. This is actually, it doesn't sound like it would be super tough, but in industry, the idea of scalability is actually really, really important because Having, you know, for example, a couple of users or a couple of books or a couple of patrons is a lot easier to deal with than having, you know, a million. One of the things that sometimes like startup companies will have problems with is they might have 10,000 users and they can handle it. But if that 10,000 user base grows to a million user base, all of the things that they had in place for the 10,000 don't work anymore. Um, you know, having a website that was getting 10,000 hits a day and is now getting a million hits a day, that's going to be a different problem. That's going to cost different amounts. That's going to have different wear and tear on the systems. That's going to have different wear and tear on even things down to like, you know, customer service of the company. If you have, you know, one or two people emailing you, hey, I'm having this problem every day, you can have somebody that's responding to it. If you have a thousand people emailing you, hey, I'm having this problem every day, one person can't handle that. Um, okay, so database schema also will help with optimization. So if you know how your database is organized, we can make our queries run faster. Now, optimization and query optimization is actually a really big topic, and that's gonna be our topic for week five next week. Maintenance. When we have a database, we are going to end up needing to make updates to it. We have to fix problems. We have to add in more data. We might have to get rid of some data. We might have to reorganize our data. You know, as we go along with our database, it might be that we're like, oh, well, it turns out, you know, we don't really just need book title, author, publisher, and publication date. It turns out we actually also need to have genres because people are doing it by genres. We also need to have, uh, you know, trigger warnings because people are starting to shop by trigger warnings. Like these are different things that we didn't necessarily know when we were building the database because, you know, if we had a database and we started our database of books in 1950, the landscape of what books looked like in 1950 is not the same as the landscape of what books look like in 2024. Uh, if you don't believe me, I invite you to go check out Book Talk. That never would have worked in 1950. 
But like that kind of maintenance and updates is part of why we want to have our schemas. Security. When we have a database, it's important to have a plan for security. We need to know how we're storing our data and we need to know how we're protecting our data. We need to know what's considered sensitive data and we need to have that clearly labeled along with our plan in place for what we're doing to take care of that sensitive data. We need to make sure that we have this clearly labeled in lots of places so that anybody that's working with our database also knows that that is sensitive data. So if we have like, you know, for example, patients, patient IDs, um, you know, diagnosis, medications, the medication list by itself might not be sensitive, but patient names and insurance numbers and social securities, that's sensitive data. The table that is connecting the patient name to the name of the medication like we don't necessarily want everybody having access to that so we want to make sure that's protected in some way okay so different types of schema so when we talk about schema we can have different types in terms of what we are trying to describe with it now we could have a physical schema this is where it's how is the data actually being stored. So like when we have this data physically being stored somewhere, how is that happening? The logical schema will include the relationship of the tables, rules, and sometimes ER modeling. View schema is how the end user will work with the database. Um, for some people, they might find view schema a little bit easier. For some people, uh, the logical schema might be a little bit easier. <laughs> ER diagrams and the type of schema modeling that we're gonna be doing are gonna look very, very similar. That's okay. The idea is just, we wanna make sure that we have all of the information about our database written down. We wanna have a way of being able to visually represent it. And we wanna have a way of being able to include things like relationships and keys and data rules. So, there's a lot of different design options for how we can create schema. We are going to be talking about all of the ones that I have listed here. You end up choosing schema based on the data that you have and what you want to be doing with the data. Um, now, when we talk about these schema options, um, you end up having to sort of say like, okay, well, I could do this, but maybe this one actually works better, better for the thing that I actually want to show or the amount of data that I have or the amount of people that would be accessing it, you know, whatever. So a flat model. It's a single table. Like, there's not really another way to put that. You basically have the rows and the columns. If you could reasonably get away with a spreadsheet, you could probably get away with a flat model schema. This might be, for example, useful for a small company. Small company doesn't have that many employees, but they do end up wanting to have an employee database. Could they technically get away with an employee spreadsheet? Yes, but it could be that it's harder to access or if the company starts growing, that's gonna turn into more of a problem. There's a lot of small businesses that will actually use spreadsheets instead of databases simply because they don't have somebody on staff that knows how to use a database. And there are some times where spreadsheets do make more sense, but like employee records kinda go better with a database hierarchical model. So this looks like a tree structure. If you've done any programming, you'll see that this looks really familiar. There's generally going to be a root node. This is good for things like nested data. We call it a uh, parent child because you end up having tables that relate to the above tables. So well, my use case is a school. So if I ended up having say a college, then that college is going to have different departments or, you know, divisions. And then the divisions will have different departments within the division. So the department might end up having, you know, for example, uh, the employees that work for that department, or if it's division, the different departments that work in that division. And we might end up having an entire table of that. Um, we might end up having an entire table of the courses each department ends up actually offering. Those courses could be broken up into things like theory and labs or lecture and labs. 
And then we might end up having a table of the teachers that teach each of those courses. And we might end up having a table of like all of the students that are in that department or division. And so organizing it in this way might end up making sense depending on what your goal is for this data, kind of the questions that you want to be asking of it, and how these tables would need to relate to each other. A network model schema is going to be similar to the hierarchical schema. However, network model allows many to many relationships, whereas networking schema only allows one to many relationships. The networking model also allows workflows. So a workflow is basically like how you can follow through what's actually happening with some of your data. So the example use case that I've pulled here is a restaurant chain. So you need to keep track of your inventory, you need to keep track of your employees, but you want to model, say, workflows for cash and food delivery. So you have to figure out who's actually touching the food, who's actually touching the money, and how can that flow through this database that's going to include the list of all of our food, the money that we're keeping track of for the day, the list of all of our servers, the list of all of our cashiers, stuff like that. A relational model schema is mostly used for relational databases. This is really helpful for keeping track of the tables and the relationships. For some people, they will label this as better for object-oriented design. But one of the things that's really nice about this is it allows us to actually see how the tables relate to each other in a more visual way. So um, we could have, you know, for example, a school where we end up having classes, faculty, students, departments, divisions, any other data that's related. So we could have tables that are going to include all of that. And then we could say like, you know, faculty belong to this department, faculty belong to this department in this division, faculty teach these classes, these classes belong in this department, these classes belong in this division. And we can see how all of those different relationships work. Now, another example um, is actually going to be using cars. So we could say, okay, well, if we have a table that's the model of the types of cars, then maybe we end up having other tables that are going to relate because we're going to have makes and colors. Well, this could actually also end up relating to the inventory if we're talking about selling or renting these cars because the inventory will be able to tell us things like, what color cars do we have? What, color, what kind of makes and models for the cars do we have? If we are selling all of these cars, what kind of incentives do we have on offer right now? And how do those relate to what we have in inventory? And so we can actually list all of those out and show those a little bit more. A star model schema is generally used for larger amounts of data. So you'll actually see this being used in data marts and data warehouses really frequently. This is called a star model because of its appearance. There's the one table in the center, and then the uh, that's called the fact table. Connected to that are tables off of that called the dimensional tables. The relationships are described using foreign keys. So in this case, the example is sales. Sales will end up having you know the product, the order, the customer, the employer, stuff like that. The product dimension is going to be information about our product. So it's the product ID, product name, product category, and how much does it cost? The employee dimension is going to tell us information about our employees. So that's going to be the employee ID, but the employee name, the title, the department, where they work out of. Customers is going to have, you know, customer name, address, city, zip, stuff like that. And all of that's going to relate to sales because sales is keeping track of who bought where, when, and for how much. So you can see how all of these end up being connected to each other. Snowflake model schema is, they call it an adaptation of the star. So with the star, we had that central table, that fact table, and then there was the dimensional tables off of that central star table. You'll also see snowflake being used in data marts and data warehouses a lot. 
But what ends up happening with the snowflake is we don't have a single fact table with a couple of dimensional tables off of it. We can actually continue branching. That's why it's considered a snowflake. So we can end up having, you know, sales and then we end up having the, you know, say customers, products, employees. But maybe employees need to be broken down more into different departments. Maybe the products need to be broken down more into different categories. And so whenever we have data that should be broken down more, Snowflake will be helpful for that. Sometimes this can be really helpful if, for example, maybe we started smaller, we started with a star schema, and then we were like, actually, you know, we have way more inventory, we have way more employees than we we're expecting, way more customers than we we're expecting, and it's getting really hard to keep track of this. We want to normalize our database a little bit, so we're going to go for more of a snowflake model, and we're going to break out more tables. So, understanding schema. Simple, huh? Um, so hopefully that helped a little bit and the idea of what a schema is, why we use them and why they're considered important for both the database design, but also the maintenance so that we can keep track of what's going on and we can share it with other people and make sure that we're keeping on track for continuing to use our database in the way that it was intended to be used. So I hope that was helpful and I hope you're all having a lovely week.